Judges chapter 14. Jeremiah said, Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Job said, I esteem the words of thy mouth more than my necessary food. Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We have an amazing book. Thank God. And thank God for the churches that stand by, thus saith the Lord, God's word. It's eternal. It does not change. I want to thank you for your hospitality. Thank you, Pastor Dameron, for inviting me. I have enjoyed myself tremendously. It's been good to be back and good to have my daughters with me at the same time. And we've had great fellowship and my oldest grandson as well. We've had a great time of fellowship. I'll tell you, the messages have stirred my heart. Brother Betrell on soul winning just stirred me up again. I don't know about you, but I need to hear that over and over and over again. Constant reminders. Flesh doesn't like doing that. But I'll tell you, that is the command. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That message this morning, that was powerful. I want to tell you what, that was great preaching. And thank God for it. I still can't get out of my head the facts that that guy was receiving at the... Uh, where was that at? Subway, I guess, someplace like that. But anyway, I, I, I thought about that all afternoon. <laughs> In Judges chapter 14, we have part of the story of Samson. You'll notice beginning in verse 1, And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the, of the daughters of the Philistines. I'm still, still tickled about that. And anyway, And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren, or among all my people, that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson, Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. For at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel." Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath. Now that's important. He's at the vineyards. That's one of the places where a Nazarite was not supposed to go. And behold, a young lion roared against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him and he rent him as he would have rent a kid. And he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. And he went down and talked with a woman, and she pleased Samson well. And after a time, he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and mother, and he gave them, and they did eat. But he told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. I want to preach a message that I've entitled, The Grossest Story in the Bible. Or we could also call it, The Biggest Loser. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I beg you tonight again for the filling of the Holy Ghost of God. Lord, thank you for how you have blessed this church this week with each of these speakers Thank you, dear God, for the music and the blessing that has been. But as we turn our hearts to the preaching of the Word of God again tonight, there are no doubt some people in this auditorium that you would have this message for. They are in danger of losing all the great benefits that they have had. God, have your way in lives tonight. Convict, and we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I don't normally have a queasy stomach. But there are some things that really just kind of set me off. I remember on our first trip to Mexico, first mission trip to Mexico, we were in Saltillo, Mexico, first time there. And after a full day of work, working on a church building to try to get everything nice and right for the folks that were there, they had a, they cooked a goat in a pit. And we're standing around getting ready to eat that smelled delicious, all of that. Well, one of the Mexican men came over to me, and he had a plate, and on that plate were two eyes. They were the goat's eyes. 
And the missionary said to me, now I don't trust missionaries very far, but the missionary said to me, now Brother Allison, they want to have you have these goat's eyes, and the reason is they give these goat's eyes to the honored guest. I looked down at those eyes, and they looked back at me, and I said, I'm not going to eat it. He said, but you've got to eat it. You'll offend them. I said, well, then they'll just have to be offended because I'm not going to eat it. If they came to my house and there was something I wanted them to eat but they wouldn't taste it, I wouldn't make them eat it. So he said, well, okay then, they'll give you the second best thing. And the Mexican man went over to the mouth of the goat, tore it out of his mouth, and put it on a plate for me. I said, I'm not eating that either. <laughs> Just give me a tortilla and I'll be fine. <laughs> when I was a young father, my daughter Kathy was up there to where she could talk and ask for things. I was drinking a Coca-Cola. Man, this goes back a lot of years. And uh, <clears throat> she said, Daddy, can I have a drink? And I said, why, sure you can have a drink. And I handed her my little bottle of Coca-Cola and she took a drink and gave it back to me. And then I took a drink, and as I drank, I <laughs> felt pieces going down my throat. <laughs> I looked at the Coca-Cola, and there was cookie pieces floating around in there. <laughs> and I learned a lesson that every dad has to learn. That whenever your child says, Daddy, can I have a drink? The first thing you do is you say, open your mouth, let me see. Is it clean? <laughs> I don't like floaties. I'm sorry, that made me gag. And I did used to really like to drink Coca-Cola. But there are some things worse than that. We come to this story of Samson. Samson is a man that when most people think of him, why, he was the strongest man that ever lived. But when I think of Samson, I think of a big loser. Here is a man who had everything going for him. He was separated from the time that he was conceived to be a Nazarite, to be special in the service of God. Now, Nazarites had some things that they were not supposed to do. And you understand, there were Nazarites from birth, and there were also Nazarites by choice for just a select period of time. Now, Samson was to be one of those that was dedicated to the Lord from the very beginning, which meant they were not to have anything to do of the fruit of the vine, nothing. Not the grape, not be in the vineyard, nothing. Not only that, they were not to touch anything that was dead. And as you know, they were not to cut their hair as a sign that they were totally set apart and separated unto God. Now, Samson grew up. We find Samson in his life never making a spiritual statement. Even when it came time to die later on, and he's standing in the pavilion there of the, of the Philistines, he said, Lord... Avenge me of my two eyes. It was his sin that got him in the mess he was in, and he was just interested in vengeance instead of the glory of God. His story is a very disturbing story throughout. In this particular passage, we find him going down to Timnath, land of the Philistines, to find for himself a wife. That was a place where he had no business going to, of course. But on the way down there, he's in a vineyard. He had no business in there. A lion comes upon him, and this man, being strong as he was, slew the lion, went on down to Timnath, and there he was finding for himself a wife. A couple days later, as he was coming back, he wondered about that body. Something about guys... You know, if gals are walking on the side of the road and they smell something rank, they go to the other side of the road. Guys, if they're walking down the road and they smell something, what is that? <laughs> That's cool right there. It's bloated and, man, the maggots going in the eyes. That's cool. Come here and see this, George. You 
Well, Samson was just like any other guy. He's got to look at it. And he goes over there. Now, this carcass has been rotting, pictured on the side of the road, if you would. Some maggots going through the eyes and out the nose. Some flies buzzing or flying around. But he noticed a strange thing, something he'd probably never seen before. Some bees had made a honeycomb there in the carcass of the lion. Now picture this, if you would. I, this I cannot imagine. But he goes to the carcass of the lion, probably brushed aside a few maggots there, put his hand down into the carcass, got some honey. That's pretty good. I'll bet mom and dad like some of this. And he goes down and he gets some more and takes it home to his mom and dad. Now, of course, touching the dead body made him unclean. On top of that, giving the honey out of the dead body to his parents made his parents unclean as well. Now, he knew there were certain things that he was not to do, but he was like a lot of Christians. Hey, look how strong I am. I can handle it. I don't see what's wrong with it. Therefore, it must be all right. A few years ago, we had a man come by our church. His pastor brought him by so that we could meet him. His name was Del Wilkes. For those of you who may have been lost back in the 1990s, you would remember that name as the man who was the patriot a wrestler with the WWE or WWF or one of those W's anyway. But he was a very famous wrestler. He would have crowds of 20, 30,000 people in these big arenas cheering him on. From what I understand, he was a big deal. I don't know if you know this or not, but he was brought up in an independent Baptist home. As a matter of fact, it was down in Georgia. His parents were very close friends with Brother Sammy Allen and the camp meeting down in Rosaka, Georgia. They knew Brother Allen well, all of that. Well, Del Wilkes was brought up all around that. Del Wilkes was an athlete. He played football, got a football scholarship to a university over there in either North Carolina or South Carolina. Understand he was an All-American, all of that, but he didn't make it into the pros, and so he turned to wrestling. And while he turned to wrestling, it wasn't long. He was away from everything that he had been brought up in. Of course, as you know, those wrestlers do get injuries from time to time, and they end up suffering some pains that are more than the type of aches and pains that we have as we get older, so that he would need prescription medication to dull the pain so he could continue to wrestle. Now, according to the testimony that he gave that night to our young people, he talked about all that he had, thousands of fans screaming and cheering his name, money rolling in. There wasn't anything that he desired that he could not get. But you know, there came a time when the doctor wouldn't write any more of the prescriptions, and so another wrestler showed him how he could write his own prescriptions. And then he got caught, and he went to jail. By the time that I meant... Del Wilkes. And as I said, he was back in an independent Baptist church now, 40 some years old, all those thousands upon thousands of dollars that he had made, all gone. He is now an ex con. And at that time, I believe he was 42 years of age, or somewhere around there when I met him, living at home with his mother, and he had to be driven everywhere because he was not allowed to have a driver's license. You know, as I looked at that guy, and that strapping guy, couldn't help but think of Samson, who had everything going for him, it would seem, just being brought up in the right place, hearing the right things to begin with, and like Samson, made a mess of all of it. Unfortunately, his story is repeated far too often in church homes. And what happened to Samson? Samson. 
Well, first of all, in the passage we see that he went someplace he had no business going. If you look in verse 1, it says, And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman of Timnath and the daughters of the Philistines. He had no business in Timnath. The heathen were there. The Philistines were there. The enemies of God were there. Young people, would you understand this? That there are places your parents do not want you to go because the enemies of God are there. You'll hear your God's name cursed. You'll hear everything about the Bible slandered. And they don't want you there because you have no business there. Here's Samson going where he never should have went. I, I doubt that he had any intention of ever being so filthy as to reach down into the carcass of a dead animal, a rotting carcass, and taking something out of it and just eating it with his hands. I doubt he ever would have thought that he would have ended up like that. But here he is, down at the Philistines, around their pagan religion, the unsaved girls that were there, no intention of ending up like he did, but he ended up there anyway. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 4, that we're to bring up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. In Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, listen, folks. God's given us some great promises. But please understand this. God never takes away anybody's free will. You're responsible for the decisions that you make. Well, mom and dad tried to keep me from having fun. Do you really think? that your mom and, mom and dad sat down when they brought you home from the hospital, what do we think that this child will want to do in their life? They can't do it. We don't want them to have any fun. We don't want, do you really think that your parents did that? When your parents say don't go there, they have a reason. There's nobody on the planet that loves you as much as they do. You can trust them. They've taken care of you. They've raised you. You get in the wrong place, and some things that you were warned about start looking pretty good. He saw a woman there, the daughter of the Philistines. Of course, I look at Eve. I wonder what she's doing even hanging around the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was the one tree she wasn't to eat from, not at all. But the Bible says Eve saw the fruit. David, at a time when kings went forth to battle, wasn't in battle. Instead, he's in the palace, and the palace would not normally be a bad place or a sinful place for him to be at, but it wasn't the place where he was supposed to be at right then. And he saw Bathsheba. You know, the Bible says we're to let our eyes look right on. In Proverbs chapter 4, after saying, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And then he says, Put away from you a froward mouth. The next thing is, you've got to be careful what your eyes are going to see. Let me tell you something, folks. There are places on the TV your eyes don't have a business seeing. There are places on the Internet your eyes don't have any business seeing. There's a lot of things we have no business looking at. Psalmist said, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. When I was pastoring in Tennessee Ridge, Tennessee, there was an area pastor, Methodist Church, that was having Francis Schaeffer's video series on How Shall We Then Live? He asked me if I'd like to come over. So I thought, well, okay, I'll go over and find out what it has to, what it has to say. I went over there, and the night I was there, Francis Schaeffer was covering the Renaissance. And, of course, covering the Renaissance, they started showing pictures. I'm sorry, the pictures they drew. I don't care who did it. I don't care if Michelangelo did it. I don't care if Rembrandt did it. But if there are nudes on that thing, that's pornography. And so when that showed up on the screen, I walked out. He called me the next day. He said, uh, Pastor Allison, why did you leave? I said, man, you were showing pornography right there in your church. He said, did you lust? I said, listen to me. I'm a man. <laughs> what, what are you? Where did we ever get this idea that it's all right for us? to see things that God says we have no business looking at. Lot vexed his righteous soul from day to day. 
And you read 2 Peter chapter 2, and I'm glad God put that in the Bible because if we didn't have 2 Peter chapter 2, there's no way we'd come to the conclusion that Lot was a saved man. But he vexed his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing day after day, day after day, day after day, and you're not going to bring it into your home and pipe it in there, whether it's morning, evening, late at night, 2 o'clock in the morning. We had a revival a couple of years ago, and the evangelist was preaching away. I mean, he got to preaching and preaching hard. He said, by the way, ladies, if your husband's getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning and getting on the Internet night after night, he's into pornography. As soon as he said it, it got quiet. You could hear a pin drop. And he just went right on preaching. But a whole lot of folks had just stopped right there and were thinking. A lot of people get up at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning and get on the Internet night after night. Why? Right. Amen. Why? Now, you said, well, there's some good things. I think Wikipedia was mentioned the other day, the bastion of truth, or maybe this morning. Uh, but there's so much trash on there, trash and filth and wickedness. TV's been bad enough for the many decades that it's been around, but since Al Gore invented the Internet, <laughs> pastors have lost their ministries, deacons have lost their homes, Sunday school teachers have lost their family in any respect anybody's had for them. I want to tell you, the Internet has destroyed more Christian homes, more Christian testimonies than any other tool I believe the devil has used from the time of creation to today. And yet we think that somehow we're not going to be affected. People are vexing their righteous soul every day and they're not taking heed you say well i'm an adult isn't that interesting how they label adult you'd get the idea if you had come from another planet and was just learning english that when you saw the word adult you know that's got to be a dirty word adult entertainment what does that mean adult humor what does that mean you get the idea if it's adult it's filthy i got news for you adult you don't have any more business listening to it, watching it, seeing it, than your children have. It's not adult. It's just wicked. He went someplace. He never should have gone. Young people that go to movies and dances and see things that look good, even though their preacher and their parents have warned them, well, sure, the devil's got things looking good. You know, the, the, the devil, he's, he's going to show you two people smoking cigarettes and drinking some alcohol, and it appears they're having a good time. But he's not going to show you with their lives ruined. He's not going to show you them laying under a drug overdose in an alleyway or laying in their own vomit. He's not going to show you them cursing one another late at night as they come home arguing under the influence of alcohol. Not going to show you that. You got no business going to some places. And Samson's beginning of his downfall here was going someplace he never should have gone. Number two, after going someplace he never should have gone, he ran with people he never should have ran with. In verses 11 through 18, we have the story. Because it's not only this one gal that he ends up running with down there, but there were a lot of Philistine guys down there. And those Philistine guys wanted to make a bet with him. You know the story about that. You start hang going places you shouldn't go, you're going to be running with people you shouldn't run with. They tell us now that probably the strongest pressure on teenagers is peer pressure. Wait a second. The strongest pressure on pastors is peer pressure. Strongest pressure on your mom and dad is peer pressure. What will people think of me? That's why it's important you run with the right crowd. So you have positive peer pressure to do right. You hang around cursors all the time. It won't be long. You'll be cussing too. You hang around drinkers all the time. It won't be long. You're going to want a taste of something. You see, when you start going places you have no business going, it won't be long you're going to be running with people you have no business running with. Choose the right peers. 
I remember we took a group to Mexico several years ago. We've taken a great number of trips to Mexico at different times. And one of the things you have to be careful about is who the kids run with. It doesn't take you long to find out who's what, by the way, in your youth group. I mean, the first two Sundays, you get a real good idea who that new family, what that teenager's like because of who they hang around. Who do they gravitate to? I can't tell you how many people have come to me and say, well, Pastor, he just keeps running with the wrong crowd. No, he is the wrong crowd because they run with the people that they are like. Why is it that Samson feels so comfortable down there among the ungodly? Because that is where his heart is at. Running with people he never should have ran with. That's this man. I gave you the story of Del Wilkes. That was his testimony. Sure, he got in the big time sports world and now this is a big deal and he's hanging out with people who curse God, hanging out with people who thought nothing of immorality, hanging out with people who didn't mind breaking the law here and there. Well, sure, he ended up where he ended up because of who he was hanging around. It does impact you. That's why, church member, you have to be careful which friends you pick. I remember when we went to Bible college back in the 1970s, we had a family that came about the same time. And we just kind of clicked. We hit it off real good to together. We'd go soul winning together, out knocking on doors, serving the Lord together. Then my wife and I began to notice that when we would go over to their house or they would come to ours when the evening was over, we weren't feeling real good about it because they had started complaining about everything. They complained about this rule at school and that rule at school and, and just numbers of things. We had to come to the conclusion that this couple that we dearly loved, that we couldn't be around them anymore. Or our own heart would get lost. As a parent, we were very careful about who our children hang around, hung around. We, we, uh, we told them, you to be friendly to everybody, but you can't be friends with everybody. You're to be pleasant with people. But there are certain people you're not going to be hanging around. By the way, when you do that, it's good that you tell them, don't say, Dad said I can't hang around you. Now you got another church problem going on. But anyway, got to be careful about that. By the way, young people, you know which young people love God and which ones don't. You know. Just like you adults, you know who the gossips are. You know who the complainers are. They might be family members. They might be somebody else. You know. He said, well, I want to be a positive influence on them. Okay, be a positive influence on them. Don't hang around them so much. You said, well, they'll get upset. Okay. What's wrong with them getting upset? You know, if people just understand certain types of behavior are not allowed around you, they'll either gravitate someplace else or they'll change their behavior. But to continue to hang around them while they're complaining and criticizing, gossiping, all you're doing is encouraging it. There are a lot of fires that would go out in churches if people stopped listening to things they shouldn't be listening to. But they do it because, you see, they're going places they shouldn't go. They're running with people they should not run with. Not only that, then he did something he never should have done. In the story that we read, he touched a dead body. Now, the honey is gross enough to me. But he touched a dead body. He was a Nazarite. It was something a Nazarite wasn't supposed to do. Do you realize that there are some things as Christians that we're not supposed to do? Keep your hand here and go over to the New Testament for just a moment. Go over to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. I want you to notice this. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 3. We can go through numbers of lists in our New Testament, but there's a particular reason why I want you to look at this passage. First of all, in verse 1, he says, Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself as uh, for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. He said, you know, there are certain things that Christians shouldn't even do one time. There are sins 
that you shouldn't even do one time. You say, I thought we're not supposed to sin all the time. I get that. I understand that. But for some reason, we have a generation of Christians today that think somehow it ought to be all right for them to do whatever they want to do because if there's something I can't do, then I'm living in bondage. And yet Paul writes in Romans, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. There are certain things we're not supposed to do. He goes on to say, For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Back in chapter 4, beginning in verse 17, he says this, I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. I got saved at 22 years of age, brought up in a home of drinking and cursing, and as I said the other night, only hearing the name Jesus is a curse word. When I got saved in the fall of 1971, I stepped from darkness into light. And the reality is, I didn't need to hear a sermon to tell me that my cussing mouth was wrong. I knew it was wrong. God cleaned up my mouth right away. I didn't have to be told in a message that drinking alcohol was wrong. There's a lot of things I didn't have to be told, but thank God I had a preacher that told me anyway. Because you took, talk to a lot of Christians today, and they seem to think, well, everything's okay. It's just a matter on how you feel about it. He did something he never should have done. He was a Nazarite. Oh, preacher, I'd never do drugs. How do you know? There are a lot of Christians that have. Preacher, I'd never go back to drink. Preacher, I'd never drop out of church. Matter of fact, when somebody starts telling me what they'd never do, I figure it's coming. I tell you one of the things that scares me the most, though, is when somebody comes up to me and they say, Pastor, I'm a thousand percent behind you. <laughs> Within six weeks, they're gone, man. I, I, you just mark it down. They're out of there. I mentioned that one Sunday and had a man going out to church, one of my deacons, he said, Pastor, I'm 87% behind you. <laughs> so, well, maybe you'll last a little bit longer. Problem is, he's gone now too. But Galatians chapter 6, <laughs> verses 7 and 8, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. You can't get away from it. You're going to reap what you sow. God has set that in motion in nature. It is also in motion, by the way, as far as your sin is concerned. So if you sow right, you reap right. You sow wrong, you reap wrong. And what you sow, you always reap more than what you sow. That's the law of sowing and reaping. I don't know about you, but I'd kind of like my future days to have a lot of joy and blessing in them. But for that to be so, I better sow right now. Here's where a lot of people get in trouble. They don't understand the principle of sowing and reaping. For Christians, by the way, that's for everybody. Saved or lost, sowing and reaping is for everybody. But for Christians, we've got something else. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourges every son whom he receiveth. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous nevertheless afterward. It yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. So here's a person, they do some things wrong, they're sowing wrong. God chastens them, and they recognize God's chastening, they repent, they get right with God. And then a month later, two months later, reaping comes. I don't understand. I thought God forgave me. He did, but he's not taking away the harvest. You still have to reap. You see, if you don't want to reap the bad things, don't sow the wrong things. And if you sow the wrong things, don't go blaming God and crying to God because you finally reap. David got forgiveness over his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah, but he had to reap with Amnon being killed, Tamar being defiled, Absalom dying. He had to reap. And God saw to it that he did. He was forgiven. But hear him cry, O Absalom, my son, my son, 
Would to God I'd died for thee. And every time I read it, I think, David, you didn't have to die for that boy. All you had to do was keep that woman out of your bedroom, and that boy would still be alive. That's reaping. By the way, David, with all that, never doubted the forgiveness of God. So here he goes someplace he never should have gone. That's where it began. And then we find him doing something that he, running with people he never should have ran with. And then he did some things that he never should have done. And then he hurt someone he never should have hurt. In verse 9, it says, And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and mother. And he gave them and they did eat. Now, even though he doesn't tell them where he got the honey, that made them unclean. I wonder why he didn't take that honey and take it back to his Philistine buddies. Make them unclean. He said, well, they're already unclean. I know. But why would he do that to his parents? His parents had raised him up for God. These people had loved him. They'd been his parents. They had provided for him. They had brought him up. For the glory of God. And when it comes time to defile someone, the, one, the two people that he doesn't mind defiling are his own parents. I'm sorry, I don't get it. And yet I've seen it over and over again. First church I pastored out of Bible college, we found out that a deacon's son had gotten a girl pregnant. Now, how I found out about it was from the teenagers. They always know. One came and told me. I called this boy and that girl into my office. I said, I understand. She's pregnant. He said, that's right. I said, have you told your parents? We said, no. I said, buddy, you stand right here because you're going to tell them. And I called up his parents. Parents, two of the finest, godliest people that I know. They, I said, you need to come down to my office. Your boy's in my office. He's got something he needs to tell you. So they drove on over to my office, and I said, uh, now just brace yourself, brother. And uh, I said to the boy, tell your dad, Diane's pregnant. A sweet, godly couple. I went so winning more with him than anybody in that church. We went every week regularly, hour after. I loved that man. Still love him today. And I looked at him as his boy gave him that news. This godly dad that wanted godliness for his children and a good testimony. And I saw his face as his heart broke. I saw his sweet wife as her, her face just fell and tears began to flow down. Listen, with all they had done for that boy, how sorry and low down and wicked could he be to destroy his own parents like that? What you do does affect others. Well, it's my body. I ought to be able to do with it what I want. No man's an island. No man lives and dies to himself. What you do does affect other people. I got a call not too long ago, a boy that was off in Bible college. His daddy called me. And he said, Pastor, I hate to tell you this. My boy's been kicked out of school. I said, no. What happened? Well, he and another boy and two girls, they went, they left the school grounds, which was against the rules, and went to a movie. He said, I'm having to fly him home. And he said, I'll do whatever you got, I got to do. He's one of the main men in the church. And I could hear the agony in his voice. Now, I don't know what that boy was thinking when he left campus that day, thinking, we're going to have a good time. Nobody's going to know. This is going to be really neat. And yet in that, he had the seeds of destruction for his own parents. And for several nights after that, they could hardly sleep, walk through the night just in agony over their children. They hurt somebody. They never should have hurt. I can understand them hurting me, hurting a lot of other people, but why on earth would they hurt their own parents who love them, love them so much? Parents that get into messes through pornography, the internet, work relationships, chat rooms, and then it comes out. And the parents have to, are the, and then the children have to live with that shame the rest of their life. 
I was preaching at a meeting in another state, and I got a call one day from a distraught father. His son, who was married, had kids, had committed a gross sin. Come to find out, he had been involved in pornography for a long time, and he had done something with the child. And now he's going to be in jail for a long time. You say, well, bless God, that's what he deserves. Yeah, I, I agree with you. That's what he deserves, but wait a second. Now his children have to live with, what does your dad do? My dad's in prison. Can you imagine that? We had a preacher in the area several years ago had his children in our Christian school. Four of the most precious little girls you ever saw. He ended up committing immorality with his secretary. And we did all we could to get him separated, get things right and all of that. But wait a second. I remember going into the kindergarten room where his precious little girl was at. That next day, I don't know how much she knew at that time, but she knew this. She looked up at me and with tears rolling down her face, she said, Pastor Allison, I'm not a PK anymore. Man, I just had to go out of the room and just cry. That guy in his lust and in his wickedness was willing to hurt his precious children. They didn't deserve that. But you see, when you start going places you shouldn't go and running with people you shouldn't run with, you'll do things you shouldn't do, and then you hurt the very people that you never should hurt. I was preaching at the Coffee County Jail. I met a man who was in there for 1129 so they wouldn't have to send him off to the prison for his fifth DUI or something like that. The man got saved. His name was George. George was a great guy. George told me in telling me his testimony of his life that he had been a firefighter. As a matter of fact, he had rose to, uh, he became an arson investigator, ended up becoming president in one of the statewide arson investigator uh, groups that they have. And he said, for the first 42 years of my life, he said, I never drank a drop. He said, but I started going to those conventions and those meetings. And it started with just one, and then another, and then he got hooked on it. And then after being hooked on it, he lost his wife, lost his children, wanted nothing to do with him. And this man who had been well-respected in the community, now he was just a drunk that nobody wanted sitting in a jail cell. Well, yeah, you start going places you have no business going. Running with people you shouldn't be running with. You're going to do things you should never do. And then his wife and children have to live with the results of it. Is this a sad story? Unfortunately, it's not just a brand new story for the first time. It's been going on for a long time. People, when they start to contemplate sin in their life, are concerned about one thing, themselves. They are selfish. And if they don't get their heart right, if they don't stop the road they're on, then they're going to hurt many. By the way, that's not all. Not only did he hurt some people he never should have hurt, but he lost some things he never should have lost. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Well, if you go over to the end in Judges chapter 16, you see, he never turned around. I mean, later on, he's hooking up with Delilah. And I'll tell you what, he ends up looking like a clueless loony bird. What's the source of your great strength? Ah, tie me with new ropes, and that'll take away my strength. And when he wakes up, the Philistines upon me, where'd these ropes come from? Oh, you must not love me. What is, the, what is the reason for your great strength? You'd think he'd learn. But people in sin are stupid. Sin does that. Hebrews chapter 3 tells us about the deceivableness, the deceivableness of sin. He lost things he never should have lost. He lost the power of God. He lost his walk with God. He lost his separation. He lost touch with God. He lost his strength. He lost his ability. He lost his sight. He lost, in wanting to be free, he lost his liberty. That's what sin does. It takes away your liberty. It takes away every good thing about you. He lost his usefulness. 
lost his testimony. You know, Samson's an interesting judge in that the people never followed him. Every act that he did, he had to do by himself. You take Gideon, he had some followers. You take Deborah and Barak, they had some followers. You look at most of the judges, they had people that were willing to fight with them. Not Samson. Even one time when he was up in Hebron and the Philistines came to arrest him, he said, uh, will you tie me up and kill me? He said, we won't kill you, but we'll tie you up. And that's when he carried the gates of the city off, of course. But he had to do it all by himself. Any pastor that's been in the ministry very long can tell you of tremendous heartaches caused by people who decided that they could be their own judge of their life and started going some places they had no business going, whether it be in the house on the Internet or whether it be out away from home on a business trip or whether it be in other places around town so they're running with people they never should run with, then they do some things they never should do and people are hurt, people they never should have hurt. And then they find themselves. They've lost everything that was precious to them. So we find Samson, last of all, standing there in the temple of Dagon. The people are mocking him. His eyes have been gouged out. He's been working like a blind donkey at the mills for the Philistines. And he's allowed to put his hands on the two pillars and said, Lord, avenge me of my two eyes. And God... In his mercy, let him destroy more Philistines in his death than he did in his life. But he died too. Because the wages of sin is death. Unfortunately, in this wicked day, the landscape is strewn with Christians who made some bad decisions and never turned around. In Madison, Alabama... We have Highway 72 that goes through, uh, goes through Huntsville, Madison, and then the next place down the road is Athens. I've said this many times to people. You know, if I see you driving down 72 headed west, I know this. I know if you stay on that road, you're going to end up in Athens. That's where it goes. Every pastor here has had times. You've told people. Now listen. Listen. You're making some bad decisions. You keep on this road, it's going to cost you. It may cost your testimony. It may cost your family. It may cost your wife. It may cost your children. It may cost you your job. It's going to cost you if you stay. Oh, pastor, how do you know that? And I just tell them, because when you're headed west on 72, if you don't stop and turn around, you're ending up in Athens. And you get on the road to sin. And brother, unless you turn around before you get to that reaping day, then all kinds of people are going to be hurt and your life is going to be ruined. Probably the most appropriate title for this is The Biggest Loser. This guy had everything going for him from the very beginning. And he lost it all because God's word was too restrictive for him. How you doing now, Samson? Stones are on you. You're dead. Die in disgrace. That's not restrictive? Yeah. He went someplace he never should have gone. Ran with people he shouldn't have run with. Did some things he shouldn't have done. And he hurt people he shouldn't have hurt. And he lost things he never should have lost. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. I know as a pastor, Lord, that too many times I find out way too late and the damage has been done and all we can do is try to mend broken hearts and help those that have been hurt. It would be great, dear God, if to, even today we could stop somebody from just going to the places they never ought to go to before they ever start running with the people they shouldn't run with or doing the things they shouldn't do. There might be somebody who started to dabble in places on the Internet. God, turn them around today, I pray. Turn them around today. Please, Father. 
They might be going to some places outside the city. They know they've got no business going, but they don't think anybody will find them. They might be on their cell phone connecting up with people that they know they have no business connecting up with. God, please, please, before they mess it all up, before they do things they shouldn't do, oh, God, please, turn them around today, I pray. Lord, perhaps there's some, they've already done it. They just haven't been found out yet. You're such a merciful God. You said, he that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh it shall have mercy. I pray they'd come tonight crying and say, oh, God, forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. Lord, you said you would if they meant business. And then God helped them to deal with the fallout. And as Brother Olson preached last night, may they own it. May there be a man. David owned what he did. He got the right kind of forgiveness and was still able to be used of God. Lord, have your way in some lives tonight. Salvage some people. Salvage some homes. Salvage some young people. And Father, we'll thank you for what you do in lives. For I ask it in Jesus' name, with their heads bowed just a moment. I wonder if there